our Bibles to the book of Daniel. We're going to continue on. We're going to finish up this chapter. And then uh, uh, we had, uh, on Emily's side of the family, extended family, um, we just found out yesterday that there was a loss of a loved one. Um, and so there's going to be a funeral in Seattle next week. So we're going to be here, but we're going to be at a funeral. So my dad's going to be able to, uh, to, uh, to, to serve, to serve you, serve us as a church and speak. And he told me kind of, I just mentioned to it yesterday. You think you could do it? Yeah. He comes this morning. Yeah. The Lord gave me a word. It's, it sounds exciting talking about renewing and, uh, uh, reviving dreams that God has spoken to your life, that we all have dreams, um, that we're born with and just different things as a young age. But, but later on in life, sometimes those dreams get crushed. And uh, I don't want to preach his message because I feel like I don't even know what it's about, but I'm just going to preach it anyway because it's so good. It's just, you just had that, that just, I don't know, just that anointing is going to be something good. So I'm excited. We're going to come back on Saturday. So, um, but yeah, that's what's going to take place next week. So praise the Lord. So Daniel chapter one, Starting in verse 8, we're going to read through verses 21. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, excuse me, who has appointed your food and drink, For why should he see your faces looking worse than younger men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So we consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrology, astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. It's an amazing story. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what has taken place this morning. We thank you for allowing us to come into your presence, helping us to have a mindset shift an acknowledgement of Holy Spirit in our lives and our, in, our, in our midst as we come together as the body of Christ, glorifying you. We thank you for our time of, of communion, time of remembrance of what you've done in your life, in your death, in your burial and resurrection, what you took upon yourself so that we could live in freedom. We thank you. We thank you for your word that brings truth, that brings enlightenment. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would speak through me, use me as a vessel of honor for your good work. I ask God, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're continuing on in our series entitled Thrive, Living in Exile, going through the book of Daniel. How can I survive Or how can I not only survive, but thrive? That's kind of the underlying thing. How can I survive, not only survive, but thrive? I got to say it a couple times. How can I not only survive, but thrive in the midst, wherever I find myself, not only in the good times, but in the bad times? How can I have a successful spiritual life, no matter what comes my way, no matter what it, it, it faces before me, how can I thrive? and not just survive, not just get by. 
One of the greatest telltale signs of discovering your future is in discovering your own attitude. I'm going to repeat that again. One of the greatest telltale signs of discovering your future is in discovering your attitude. There's a couple of famous quotes. One says, your attitude determines your direction. Your attitude determines your direction. Another one is, your attitude determines your altitude. Your attitude can determine how high you're going to go, how far you're going to go in life. It can determine the future that you're going to live out. The type of attitude that you maintain and that you hold dear can either hold you back from what God wants to do in your life, what it, you're called to do in life, or it can help to propel you forward. This morning, I want to look at and discuss the attitude that I believe that we get to see in this scripture and in this text, the attitude that Daniel maintained even though he found himself in exile. With all that he went through, with all that he faced, with all that was taken from him, how was he able to maintain a good attitude? How was he able to thrive in the midst of exile? I believe is because of the attitude that he maintained in his life. Last week, we, we talked on in, in, in uh, Daniel 1, um, verse one through verse eight, if you weren't here, we talked about just kind of the opening picture of the book of Daniel. We see how Jerusalem and Judah were taken into captivity by the Babylonian people, by King Nebuchadnezzar, this evil king. And he took some of the people into captivity and he began to brainwash them, remember? He indoctrinated them and began to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians, of these Chaldeans. And he not only tried to change them by the way they were thinking, but he tried to change their, their what were the other two points? their behavior and their beliefs. So they changed their names. They tried to change their diets. And what, what we see is that they were trying to indoctrinate them into this new system. So we see that Daniel, all of a sudden, the age of 12 to 15, that's the time frame they give us, is that all of a sudden his world was flipped upside down. It was changed in the blink of an eye where he found himself in Jerusalem, all of a sudden he found himself in exile, in captivity, in Babylon, and everything he had ever known was taken from him. And all of a sudden he had to face this pain, he had to face this loss, he had to face this agony. But what we see and what we continue to discover, even in today's text and what we're gonna to continue to discover all the way till we close this series out, is that no matter what he faced, he thrived. And through it all, he had a good attitude. That your attitude determines your altitude. And we see that Daniel maintained that good attitude that was able for his life to be able to be successful. Not only to survive in exile, not only to survive in Babylon, but to be able to thrive to being at one point second in command of all of this whole realm. I know that there's many of us that have faced pain. We face loss, we face a feeling of exile, a feeling like we don't belong, that things have been taken from us. Going through an experience that we would have never thought we would have to go through. And this is what we see in Daniel's life. And I hope and pray that, that we'll be able to have this message, have this information touch our heart and Holy Spirit can breathe upon it so that we would be able to have an attitude adjustment. I mentioned last week that I believe, even though that many people kind of are fearful of talking of the book of Daniel because of the, the end times and, and just like what we talked about the zombies, right? How people think they just don't know what's going to happen at the end times, but they know the end times are soon. And so people can be kind of fearful of this book because of the different prophecies and visions that we'll see. But I believe that it's a book of encouragement to encourage us to make the right choices, to encourage us to stand up for what we believe in, to encourage us to live the life that Christ died for each and every one of us to live. Amen. But in that encouragement, sometimes to be encouraged is to be challenged. And I believe that that is what God has given me. Uh, I'm just 
the unction, I guess you could call it, to challenge us this morning, challenge myself. If there was anyone that could have had a bad attitude, it was Daniel. With all that he experienced, with all the pain and suffering that he endured, he could have moped around. He could have had a negative attitude, but he chose instead to have a good attitude. And we see that it caused him to thrive. How many, how many are, of you are mopers? You like to mope around. Something goes bad. You're like, come on, I, I'm one of them. Don't leave me out. Come on. We need to form a mopers anonymous group. <laughs> M.A., right? Mopers anonymous. Gloomy, doomy, sad. And we like to hold on to that for as long as we can. There's something that I've recently discovered. And it's fact. Throughout the entire time frame of all humanity, moping has never improved the situation. Did you know that? I just found that out. I'm a little bit behind years. But that moping has never been able to be the answer to solve your situation or to solve the problem that you find out. But we always, almost always fall into that mindset, fall into that attitude of being a moper. It doesn't help it out, but in actuality, it probably makes things worse, amen? That it can actually make it worse in our lives. And so what I want us to see is that Daniel didn't mope around. He didn't have a bad attitude, but he maintained a good attitude. And that is a key that we need to study in deeper to see a key for us to live a thriving, successful life. Is maintaining a good attitude. And so we need to tell ourselves every morning we may wake up, I've moped my last. Amen that I am no longer a moper, but I'm a praiser because God has good in store for my life. Amen. That God is for me. He's not against me. Come on. Anybody listen to K-Love or Positive Life Radio? Just, isn't that a song? Anyways, Hiya? did we sing it this morning? Hey, praise the Lord. But your attitude, your perception, your approach to life can cause you to either thrive or to wither. So let me ask you a question this morning. How's your attitude? I know with asking ourselves this own question, if you guys were to respond, I'm sure it'd be a little biased. So if someone close to you, say your spouse or your child or, or, or brother or sister, if they were to describe your attitude, what would it be? Of course, they would be protected by a witness protection program. They would never know it was actually you that told us. But what would they say your attitude was? When things come up in life, issues arise that you have no control of, but you think you have control over, what is the attitude you hold on to? I believe Daniel maintained a good attitude because he lived his life not for himself. He lived his life not for himself. That is what we get to see in this book. This book of Daniel, what sometimes we can see and sometimes we do as we study is I want to learn from his life what he did so that I can do the right things as well and follow in the life pattern, which, which we're doing in a sense but if you actually look at the book of Daniel and study it out, it's not technically about Daniel, even though that's the title of it. What it is, is it's a book about God. It's a book about what God can do to someone that is committed and submitted to him. So our lives, is it a book about ourselves? Is that our mentality? Is that our mind frame or our mindset and our frame of mind? Or is it my life focused on God and following after him and seeing what he can do in my life? That is something that we see over and over through Daniel's life. That Daniel stood his ground, 
stood up for what he believed because his focus was on God and not on himself. And with that, his attitude that he maintained was an attitude of servitude. That is the overall, the, 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 the crux of our whole message this morning is that Daniel had an attitude of servitude. It didn't matter who God placed in his life or over his life, he served. And I believe that the only way that you can maintain an attitude of servitude is to be submitted and committed to God fully. That your focus is upon God and upon yourself. Because once we start to think about ourselves, that's our focus. That's all we want to think about. How are my finances? How's my marriage? How's my relationships? How's my job doing? In actuality, our lives are to be in service with others, to others. Jesus said that we are to be a servant of all. That he came to show us and display us to us what a servant actually looks like. And what we see as an end result, a statement that I might say over and over again, is that an attitude of servitude invites the favor of God. When you have an attitude, a lifestyle of servitude, it invites the favor of God. Look at me with Daniel 1, verse 8. I've skipped over Ecclesiastes 9, 10. I may come back to that. This is something that we read last week. We ended and we began with it. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Remember, this is something we talked about at the end where he made this, he purposed in his heart not to defile himself. He made this predetermined decision. He made a decision ahead of time before he was going to be tempted, before maybe even he even met with these eunuchs that were going to tell him what he was supposed to do, that there was something in himself that made a decision ahead of time that this is what I'm going to stand for. This is what means the most. This is how I can stand for Christ because he didn't stand up, remember, when they changed his name? He didn't stand up when they were teaching him a different language or the literature, but it was in his diet, remember, because the food was previously given to idols. So he knew that there was something that he couldn't allow himself to do because it was given over to a false worship of the one true God that he believed in. And so he stood up. He was committed to God in that situation. And what we are able to see in verse 9 says, Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of eunuchs. When you're committed, when you have an attitude of servitude, it invites the favor of God upon your life. Remember, our success, this is something I wrote down from last week, our success in our spiritual lives will be determined by what, by what you decide ahead of time. By what you decide ahead of time. The things that you know that are going to face you in the future. Pre-marriage pre counseling, I believe, is something that is amazing. We went through it, and I hope that many of you guys, maybe you didn't, but if you're thinking about marriage, it's only one person right here. I think that's, I'm joking. <laughs> you guys haven't been here for a while. I got to pick on you, Tristan. Sorry. Anyways, but we went through it, and I'm glad we went through it because these people that were with us, that were counseling us, they started to bring up real life issues that when you're in love, you're like, ooh, you know, you're like, whatever. You, you don't even think. It's like, what? Uh, you want how many kids? You know, just money, finance, a relationship, kids, all the different stuff that, that you know you're gonna face. So you have to make a predetermined decision ahead of time because I don't know if anyone else, but there's gonna be troubles in marriage, in your marriage. And when you face those troubles, what are the predetermined decisions you made ahead of time so that you can stand your ground? That we need to have these predetermined decisions. And that's what we saw in Daniel's life. And we saw that he was committed. I'm already getting to like point two or three already. But anyways, that he was committed to God. And we see that that invites his attitude of servitude invites the favor of God. What we see, I'm going to go back to, to Ecclesiastes 9.10, but what we see in his life 
is that no matter who was over him or who was before him, he served him. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might or do it with all your might. And that is exactly how Daniel lived his life because I believe he wasn't focused on God. Instead of focusing on who was in front of him, he was focusing on God and that allowed him to serve those who were around him. Amen? Our faithfulness to it, God invites the favor of God. So what does it look like to have an attitude of servitude? I'm so glad you asked this morning so we can get on with our points. Something that we see display, which I'm sure there's tons of different um, specific details that we can see. But what we see here this morning in the life of Daniel, displaying the attitude of servitude, one, humility. Daniel 1, 10 through 12 says, And the chief of the eunuch said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and waters to drink. I believe in the King James, it's actually spire. This is something that I, because I just thought it was like vegetables and water. Apparently the word that is used in King James of what it actually means is they said it was spire, but it's anything that produces seed, anything that had seed form. So it could be grains and stuff like that as well. Fruits and vegetables and grains and things like that. But anyways, that's beside the point. But what we see is he abstained. He made a predetermined decision, right? To abstain from the food because that was, that was the stuff that was, that was sacrificed to idols. And if he ate of that, then he knew that he was going to be defiling himself. That he was going to be partaking in the belief and worship of foreign false gods. And so they stood up for what was right. And they came to the eunuch and asked them that they would not be able to eat that stuff. And the eunuch says, if you guys aren't going to look good before the king, then I'm not going to look good because I'm not going to have a head anymore, right? That's pretty much what he's saying. And so Daniel takes this into consideration. He's not just thinking about himself. He's not just thinking about his, his friends, but he is also thinking about the eunuch. So he comes up with an idea. Is something rubbing? No? Good, Ethan. But we see that he makes a decision, somewhat of a compromise, test us for 10 days, and let's see at the end of that. But something that I, that I think is so profound is how he approaches the eunuch and how he talks to them. So look at Daniel 1 through 12. It says, please. I think that is supernatural right there. This guy was 12 to 15 year old. How many know 12, 15 year old boys that say please? First off, that's something you have to train. I see Sochi elbowing over here. I'll just play. I'll just play, bro. <laughs> I think that is supernatural, that he was considerate of the eunuch. Another thing that we need to take into consideration is that Daniel knew what he was being trained for. He knew that he was being trained to be one of the elite in the Babylonian culture and society. So he knew that Sooner or later, at the end of these three years, I'm going to be over this guy. But he still maintained an attitude of humility because he saw him as being placed there by God. So he served him and came up with this decision. But another thing that we see is that it says, please, in verse 12, Please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. So we see it wasn't only being considerate, saying to please and thank you and all that kind of stuff, but he also considered himself a servant to this person, a servant to another servant. That that is what we get to see, that Daniel had an attitude of servitude and it invites the favor of God. Philippians 2, 5 through 7 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What kind of mind is that? Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Other translations say that Jesus emptied himself of his privileges. That he emptied himself of what was, what was 
what should be given to him or what should be offered to him. He was God, but he emptied himself of his divinity privilege, the, the divine privileges that he had and came in the likeness of man. That he humbled himself to become like us so that one day he would die for us. That he emptied his privileges and he is the greatest display for us as a servant, that we are to live lives like Christ, amen? That we are to follow his example and he is the greatest display of a servant. That he emptied himself of his privileges. That is the mind and attitude that we are to have and to display. So when's the last time you emptied yourself of your privileges for others around you? You emptied your title, a degree, a certificate, whatever it might be, even maybe your finances, and you thought of yourself, of emptying yourself, and you looked at someone else and say, they need something that I have, and I'm going to give it to them. That is what Jesus did when he emptied himself because he saw us and how in debt we were in our life, in all aspects of life, and he died for each and every one of us. Amen. Amen that he emptied himself for each and every one of us. There's two types of people. One, one person said that there's two types of people. The one that says, here I am, serve me, meet my needs, look at me, wait on me. Or there's a person that says, how are you? Looks for the well-being of others, looks to serve others. What would best describe you? Here I am or how are you? What is the lifestyle? What is the attitude? We're being challenged, amen, this morning. We're being encouraged, amen. Put some smiles. Put the coffee on. Was there some late games on last night? I think the Cowboys lost, amen. I got past, uh, text Pastor Eli. Proverbs 3.34, and the good news says, he has no use for conceited people, but shows favor to those who are humble. 1 Peter 5.5 5 in the good news translation says, in the same way you younger people must submit yourselves to your elders, and all of you must put on the apron of humility to serve one another. For the scripture says, God resists the proud, but shows favor to the humble. The attitude of servitude displays humility and humility invites the favor of God. It causes one to thrive. Are we living a life of servitude, of humility? Because it invites the favor of God and it causes one to thrive. And that's what we're talking about. That's what this series is about. This is the key, amen? Number two, the attitude of servitude displays commitment. It's a big word for some of us, amen? Commitment. Do we keep our word? Daniel 1, 12 through 15 says, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servant. So we consented with them in this matter and test them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. We see Daniel was committed to God. He was committed to the diet. Amen. He was committed to his word. And he was committed to the steward. He was committed to God because he stood up for what he was right and what he believed. He was committed to the diet for 10 days. He was committed to his word because if those 10 days something went wrong, he didn't look as good as he did, then he was going to scrap it all and do what the steward told him. And he was committed to the steward also by his word. To be committed takes courage, and that's what we see in Daniel's life, that he took courage to stand up for what he believed, but it also took courage to be committed. The attitude of servitude is a choice. We talked on this last week, remember? How we have Holy Spirit inside of us. We have the power of God, the same power that raised Christ from the grave, dwells in our mortal body, amen? 
Amen. You guys were amen to me last, last week when I was sharing that point. But now there's some, there's, some added, there's some things that you have to decide because you have the power of Christ. That you can have the choice to be walk in humility and to be committed. What are the areas that Christ is asking you, Holy Spirit is asking you to be committed in this morning? Maybe it's even just a bad attitude about something, bad attitude about a job, bad attitude about marriage, bad attitude about finance, bad attitude about kid, bad attitude about your school, bad attitude about whatever it may be. But what is God calling you to be committed to? Not to be served, but to serve. The school your kid goes to or you go to, the, the job that you have, the career path, the, the person that God placed in your life as a, as a spouse, the children he gave you, even, even the church that you come to, are you committed? Do you come to serve or to be served? Jesus said that we are to be a servant of all. That to be first, you must be last. If you want to be the greatest, you got to act like you're the least. Amen. That is the lifestyle. Because what we see even in Jesus's life, because he's our ultimate example, is that he wasn't only committed to God the Father, he was committed to each and every one of us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? That while we were still sinners, he died for us. Even before we knew what real love was, before we knew what forgiveness was, before we knew what grace was, before we knew what salvation was, he died for each and every one of us before we knew him, that he died for us. That shows commitment. That shows the commitment level that God is asking us to raise ourselves up to for those around us. There's something that kind of a profound statement that came to me as I was studying this. And it can be hard for some of us to take this on and to believe this. But to God, the Babylonian lives matter just as much as the Hebrew lives. What about our context of life? the people we see on a daily basis that are far off from God, those lives matter just as much as our lives as holy, sanctified believers. It can be a hard pill to swallow sometimes, can it? But is that the way we're living? Is that how committed we are? Because again, God calls us to be a witness, amen? He gives us the power to be a witness, to authenticate the goodness of God in the land of the living, to be able to show others the grace and love of God. And I know for many things that I I remember going through in my own life as an HVAC technician in a maintenance job thinking there's no room for me to move up in finances. There's no room for me to grow up in promotion. I know that many of you guys kind of feel the same thing that there's no room to grow, there's no room for, 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 for uh, promotion. And it can cause you to dwell on that and have a mindset of depression in your life. But something that we need to see is sometimes the job isn't there for us. And we're not there for the job. We could be there for those around us. And that is something that came into, into my life that I realized sometimes I think too late that God placed me there because I started to see the brokenness of the people's lives that I came into contact with every day. And once I realized it, it broke my heart for them. And I was able to be used by God to pray with them, to love on them, to just speak life into their lives and be a witness for them. Are we committed to those around us like Jesus was committed to us, amen? Attitude of servitude invites the favor of God. And here we get to see some of the favor upon Daniel's life because of his attitude and and upon his three friends. But we see God's supernatural work. When we live a life of attitude, 
the attitude of servitude, it invites the favor of God, and we get to see God's supernatural work. Look at Daniel 1.15. It says, And at the end of ten days their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacy. Now, most of us would argue, including myself, that I don't need God's work to look fatter. Can I get an amen? I can do that on my own. But we see that God blesses them. He blesses his commitment that they actually looked better. We need to look better. Amen? Amen? Do we look better? We need to look better. We look good. Come on, Danny. Wish we all had your jeans. He has a say. He has a say. I don't know if I should say it. I'm not going to say it. (laughs) Ask me afterwards. I'll tell you. But look at the real supernatural. Not only should we look good, but Daniel 1, 17, 21 says, As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus, Daniel continued the first year of King Cyrus. I underline those for you so you could count them. That's six times the word all is used. And when God puts all in the Bible, it means all. That is the extent of a supernatural work of his favor upon their lives, that they were 10 times smarter, that they looked better, they acted better, they were wiser, they understood things, even though they were new to the culture, they understood it better than these people that that grew up in the culture. That he gave them wisdom with visions and dreams, that this supernatural work upon their lives, all because they made it a crucial decision at a young age to maintain an attitude of servitude. And I know God can redeem our past lives, our past choices, our past attitudes that we had in the past, but I don't want us to overlook the daily decisions, the daily attitudes that we need to have in our lives. Look with me, this final scripture, Daniel 121, it says, thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. That's a 60 year frame. A choice that he made when he was 12 to 15 years old to have a good attitude, to make the right decision, to be committed, to walk in humility. That decision altered his future. 60 years, he walked in the favor of God. That is the grace and favor of God that he has for each and every one of us. At least someone's given me an amen. That was a good point. Come on, Liliana, give me something. (laughs) Set that, that's the time span of seven kings. It wasn't just Nebuchadnezzar for all those 60 years. There were seven different kings from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, counting him, all the way to King Cyrus. And he was the man. He had the favor of God and he was their advisor because they had an attitude of servitude and an attitude of servitude, what? Oh, man. <laughs> Invites the favor of God, Amen. When your focus is on self, it brings a limited perspective. But with a focus on God, your perspective can be limitless. Let's stand up, get the worship team. Maybe we need to have the kids in here. I'm just playing. I love you guys. I'm playing. Praise the Lord. I know sometimes with, when, when there's, a, when there's, a, there's a hard pill to swallow, one of, our, one of our favorite movies, and it's not, I mean, it's not a Christian movie by any means, Mary Poppins. But sometimes with, with some medicine, you need to take a little sugar. So I'm glad that we're able to have a joke because I think this is some medicine that we need to take. We need to 
ask ourselves, maybe even ask someone that's close to us, how really is my attitude? And I think this is something that going into our, our fast that we're gonna be doing 10 days, maybe this is something that you need to pray about and ask Holy Spirit, give me the strength to make the right choice, to have the right attitude. Is my focus on myself or is my focus on others around us? So this morning as we go into this song, if you need prayer for anything, maybe this message spoke to you. Don't let pride hold you back, come forward. If there needs to be an attitude change, allow the Holy Spirit to minister, allow him to speak. Maybe there was something that I said that actually brought you down the road in your mind in a, in a, in a rabbit trail of something else that Holy Spirit wants to pinpoint in your life. Allow him to minister to you. But let's go into this song and then if you need prayer for anything, I just invite you up. Maybe we can dim the lights a little bit.